Well, welcome to Living Grace Evangelical Church. If you please stand with me, we'll begin our time of worship. Let's sing. Let our praise be your welcome. Let our songs be a sign. We are here for you. Yes? Okay, here we go. Well, uh, amen. Good morning. Welcome to Living Grace Evangelical Church. Thank you so much for joining us this morning, and it's exciting. We're in a building, right? We're in our building. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you uh, so much for all of you who have helped out in so many different ways with, you know, renovations, cleanup, with also with prayer support and generosity. Uh, It's because of you, that we are in this place, right? Because of your faithfulness to the Lord, the Lord's faithfulness to us, but because of your prayers and your dedication to him. You know, God has provided this building for us, and we're just so grateful, so thankful for you joining us this morning, and um, thankful that we're able to be in this place. And so 
uh, just an awesome thing. And so just a couple quick announcements as we continue our time and just, you know, as we think about what today is. Today, obviously, we celebrate Independence Day, right? We celebrate the birth of a nation, uh, the nation that, we, you know, we call home, the nation that many of us maybe have even, you know, fought for or served in many different capacities. And so we're just so grateful to live in a nation where we experience the freedoms, the ability to gather in this place unhindered, unimpeded. And so we want to continue to pray for our nation, uh, pray for our, the leaders of our nation, and, you know, obviously recognizing we live in this tension of the here and not yet, that this place is not our home. And so how do we be good servants and, and Christians? How do we be good people who, who live for the betterment of their nation, but yet also recognizing that this place is not our home, right? And so we live in that tension, but we're so thankful that we are blessed to live in this place in America. And so... We want to be praying for our nation, our, our, our leaders in that, in our nation, you know, just kind of lifting that up. But uh, the, the announcements I want, to, I want to just uh, put out there real quick is first is prayer meeting is this week. We're going to meet here. And so that's this Tuesday at 7 o'clock. And so if you can join us for prayer meeting, that'd be wonderful. We'd love to have you as we pray for the needs of each other as well as for our nation. And so that's prayer meeting this week. And also, uh, we've get, been getting some requests and some questions, and so I want to just kind of make sure that everybody's well informed that, you know, we, we do have a renovation fund that's an approved budget item that you can donate to. We've been getting some requests, and so um, the way that we're, we're asking people is that if God lays on your heart to give to the renovation here, that it would be above and beyond your tithe. Uh, that you would do that through the renovation fund and all those kind of go, it goes into a slush fund for all the approved budgetary items that we have uh, for many of the different projects that we're going to be doing, like, you know, the roof, the siding, you know, gutters, all that kind of stuff, as well as some, some kind of interior stuff as well. And so uh, all that to say, we're going to have some more work days and stuff, but uh, uh, more details, keep on the lookout for that. But thank you so much for, you know, your dedication in, in helping getting this place up and ready, prepared for us uh, this morning. So let's pray as we continue our time of worship. Lord, we're just so thankful to live in this nation. We're thankful for the just freedoms that we enjoy, maybe at times that we even take for granted, that we can gather here unimpeded, unhindered. Lord, we just thank you so much for our nation, and Lord, we recognize that you know, our nation, as great as it, it is, there, it's not perfect, right? There's faults and flaws in everything because everything is marred by sin. And so, Lord, we do pray for the blessing of our nation. We pray, Lord, that you would bring revival upon our nation, that people would turn to you, to, to Jesus, would submit their lives to you, the true king. And, Lord, that you would just bring revival upon this nation, upon this land. Lord, we pray for our leaders in our nation that you would... You would help them to be sensitive to you, Lord, that you would guide and direct them in the decisions that they have to make. And Lord, for our nation and for the division and for the unrest that we, we've been seeing, Lord, that you would bring healing to this land. And we're just reminded of your word that, that tells us that if, if, if we humble ourselves and, and, and pray to you for revival and for healing, that you will bring healing. And so, Lord, uh, we ask that for our nation. We ask that for our land. And Lord... When we want that revival to happen, that healing to happen in our land, it's got to start with us. And so, Lord, heal us. Change our hearts. Lord, help us to be fully devoted to you and to your kingdom, living for your kingdom. And, Lord, may that translate into our nation. And so, God, let it begin with us. So, Lord, we welcome you to this place as we just sang. We invite the Holy Spirit here to convict and challenge and, and direct us and teach us. And so, Lord, have your way here in this service, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
us, Lord. We thank you for the power in that name. And no matter what we're going through in our lives, Lord, what our circumstances are, what we're feeling, what we're fighting with every day, God, we can come to you every day and just feel this peace, this peace in our hearts that we can't describe, Lord, but your name, your name is all we need. We thank you, Lord, so much for this morning, for this time of worship, and we praise you and bless you. In your name we pray, Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Well, thank you, worship team, for that reminder and that great intro as we are talking about our new series here, Digging into the Kingdom of God. We're talking in this series called Kingdom First. We're beginning it today. And really that song emphasized really the fact that now and forever, God, you reign. That yours is the kingdom, yours is the glory, the name that is above all names. And so it's a helpful reminder and a great way to introduce ourselves to this topic as we dig into it. And, uh, you know, as I was thinking about this and trying to figure out how to... Uh, I don't know, just introduce this. I, I, my mind went to a movie. I don't know why, but it went to the movie Zootopia. If you've ever seen, anybody seen the movie Zootopia? So I'll kind of give a brief synopsis of the movie Zootopia. You, we kind of follow the life of Judy Hopps, who's this kind of rabbit uh, that can talk, obviously, you know. And, and the reality is, is she's from this rural town called Bunnyboro, but she has great aspirations. She doesn't want to be a a farmer like her parents, like her family, she wants to be a police officer. And not just any police officer, she wants to be a police officer in Zootopia. Zootopia is this huge city, it's this metropolis where all these animals live, whether they're carnivores or herbivores, right? They all live in this city in peace and harmony in, it's kind of an animal utopia, and in 2016, this film released, and it, it topped the box office in like several countries. It netted over a billion dollars in the year that it was released. And the reality is, is I think that people like that because we're fascinated with this idea of utopia, right? We're fascinated with this idea of utopia, right? Utopia is that idea that heaven on earth, right? That's about essentially what utopia means. And I think the human mind is fascinated with it. Why? Because we were created for utopia, right? Go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. We were created to live in utopia, heaven on earth, in right relationship with God and with one another. We were created for that, and arguably we are trying to get back to utopia since the fall. And that's why we see, you know, why governments and nations and rulers rise and fall, right? Is the idea that we can do better, that there's a more perfect way of living, a more perfect way of governing. And arguably, I think that that's part of where the conflict is right now in our country, right? The, the conflict of we can do better, there's a better way of doing things, and that kind of bleeds into discussions and arguments about equality, discussions and arguments about politics, discussions and arguments about government styles. All of this, I think, is just the baseline understanding of trying to get to, to reach utopia, this idea of heaven on earth. And this isn't really a new concept because the reality is, is this has been going on for a while. We go back to even Jesus' day, and this idea is prevalent within the Jewish people, right? Because they wrestled with this question. They wrestled with reaching this kind of ideal, perfect place, this utopia, right? And they, they wrestled with this, and, but they called it not utopia. They called it the messianic kingdom or the kingdom of God, right? That was the concept that they had. And we, we just wrapped up our series in Daniel, and not too long ago, in the not too distant past, maybe a, a couple weeks, a month, we were in Daniel chapter 7, right? And in Daniel chapter 7, we kind of were introduced to this idea of this kingdom, right? The kingdom of God, this messianic kingdom. We were introduced to the phrase, the topic, the Son of Man, right? That Son of Man that had both divine and human attributes, the Son of Man that would, was associated with this divine kingdom, which would set up this divine kingdom, this kingdom of God. And other Old Testament prophets built off of this. And, and so in Jesus' day, the people of Israel had been subjugated under the Babylonians in the Babylonian exile, the Persians, the Greeks, right? We talked about this in the Daniel series. And then up to the Romans, right? 
Hundreds of years of subjugation, hundreds of years of being underfoot of somebody else ruling over them, hundreds of years of living in their land but it being occupied by somebody else. So hundreds of years of just longing for, desiring God's kingdom, the restoration of the kingdom of Israel, the messianic kingdom. And it was kind of at its highest point when Jesus was ministering, right? It kind of reached a fever pitch, and Rome was the new ruler, and the land that the people were living in was being occupied by the Romans. The people desired to be free from Roman subjugation and oppression. They, you know, wanted a better kingdom that was ruled by the Lord's anointed one, the Messiah, who would set up the Davidic kingdom again, right? The idea of utopia, heaven on earth. In church, in many ways, I don't know if we're immune from that. I think we pursue utopia in so many different ways as well in our lives. We might not call it that. But maybe this might, you know, kind of resonate. You know, we, sometimes that we think, well, if the right political party gets into power, then everything's going to be A-OK, right? That's utopia. We do that in our jobs, Right? If I get this job, if I have this job, or if I change this job and I do this, then everything's going to be set up good in my life. I'm going to be good. Or, or, you know, in our finances, we pursue utopia. You know, if I, I earn this much, or if I save this much, or if I have this much in my retirement account, then I'm going to be smooth sailing. I'm, everything will be perfect in my life. And the list can go on and on and on and on. We pursue utopia, this idea of perfection, in many ways than we think we do. And these things are not inherently evil or bad. I'm not saying that about that, but I'm just going to say that I think what we're going to see here and what Jesus challenges us with the kingdom of God is that it it kind of shocks us a little bit. It kind of challenges this idea of pursuing perfection, pursuing heaven on earth. It challenges us that where are we putting our focus Where are we really seeking to understand and seeking to live out? Are we putting our hope in our stuff, our idea of perfection, man's kingdom, or are we putting it in God's kingdom, which will ultimately be perfect, right? So we're going to be in this series called Kingdom First, and we're going to be in here for the next probably like eight or so weeks, and uh, we're going to be digging into the Gospels, and and Jesus is teaching about the kingdom. Now, many times we talk about Jesus' teaching in the Gospels, and, and more often than not, people go and they say, well, yeah, you know, Jesus taught about loving your, your neighbor as yourself or loving your enemy. Jesus talked about, you know, um, you know we go with the quick hits, right? You know, the golden rule, do under the, unto others as you would have them do unto you, or love God and love people, right? We, we, we hit all those things, right? And those are all great teachings. But Jesus actually taught more about the kingdom of God than anything else. Jesus wasn't, you know, didn't come like butt heads with the Pharisees and he didn't butt heads with the the people in power of his day because he taught people to love one another or to be good to each other, to do good things to people like you would want them to do to you. He wasn't crucified for that. He was crucified because he preached the kingdom, kingdom that was way different than what the people in power were envisioning or were comfortable with. In the, in the Gospels alone, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the kingdom, or language about the kingdom, occurs 126 times. 126 times. And it could be, even be argued that all of the things that Jesus taught, the foundation of which is the kingdom. What does it look like to be part of living in the kingdom of God? This kingdom that is here but not yet. And so maybe if you're like me, maybe if you're, you're, you're kind of wondering, so what is the kingdom? What is the kingdom of God? That's a great intro question to ask because that's what we're really going to seek to lay out at least a little bit foundationally here today as we are in Luke 17. And so if you have your Bibles, tune in or you can kind of turn it on and scroll to or you can open it up and get to Luke chapter 17. Um, and we're going to be looking at verses 20 through, let's see, 37. 20 through 37, but we're going to be digging into this, and so I think Luke here, Jesus gives us some descriptors about the kingdom of God, and so uh, these are the descriptors we're going to look at today. So the first descriptor of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God is certain. 
The kingdom of God is certain. Let's look at just the first two verses here in Luke 17, verses 20 and 21. So being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, The kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed, nor will they say, Look, here it is, or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. Now, Luke 17 would just chronologically, if we want to put this in the position of Jesus' life and ministry, right? Luke 17 occurs really kind of towards the end of Jesus' earthly ministry, right? He's been teaching. He's been healing. He's been preaching. He's been doing, you know, casting out demons. He's been doing this for like three years. And so this is the tail end of it. He's on his way to Jerusalem for the final time. And so this is chronologically where this is happening. And so it's interesting. The Pharisees, they come to him and they're asking him, give us some signs. Tell us, when is the kingdom going to come? Like, basically, give me the hour, give me the date, give me the month. Let me know when is this going to happen? They're wanting to ask, they're wanting to know details. They want to know signs. They're looking for the kingdom, which is good. They're looking for the kingdom. But Jesus points out, he's saying, uh, you're going to miss it. You're already missing it. They wanted to know the signs so they didn't miss it. And the irony is that they were already missing it. Because Jesus, he was heading to Jerusalem. And Luke 19 even tells us that the expectation of the the coming of the kingdom was like imminent. It was going to happen. It was like any moment. It was going to happen. And Jesus' response, really, he he affirms the certainty, really, of God's kingdom, but also the mystery of God's kingdom. He's saying the kingdom is coming, but not in ways that can be observed. I mean, like, scratch your head. Like, what are you talking about here, Jesus? Okay, it's coming, but not in ways that can be observed. That word observed or that phrase that can be observed is this fun Greek word. It only occurs here. And basically, it's saying that it's not going to come with spectacular signs and wonders. You know, it's not going to come in visible or observable ways. So basically, Jesus is saying, you have this expectation of what the kingdom is going to look like, or it's going to happen like this, but it's going to come in ways that you're not anticipating it. And he finishes up his response in an even more mysterious way, and he says, because the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. Some translations, they translate that phrase that occurs there as saying the kingdom of God is within you. Now that wouldn't make sense. He's talking to Pharisees who don't ascribe him to be the Messiah, who don't affirm him as the ruler, the leader of this kingdom. And so I think the better translation, the better understanding is the kingdom of God is in the midst of you in the person of Jesus, right? Jesus, he's saying you're missing the signs already. You're, you're, you're saying give us the signs. We don't want to miss it, but you're missing it already. Because I'm here. I've been doing all these things. I've been preaching. I've been teaching. I've been healing the the lame. I've been casting out demons. I've been doing all of these things. The signs have been there in front of you the whole time, but you're missing it. But Jesus, he's talking about, he's saying the kingdom of God, it's a certainty. Jesus doesn't say if. He's he's saying it's coming. It's going to happen. It's certain. Now, it'd be helpful for us to have a definition that, to work off of when we're talking about the kingdom of God. And so I want to use this definition. It's a definition that I found in a book called Seek First by Jeremy Treat. He's a pastor and author. And he gives this definition of the kingdom of God. He says that the kingdom of God is God's reign through God's people over God's place. So you get that? That's God's reign through God's people over God's place. That's going to be the working definition I'm going to use for the kingdom throughout this series when we're talking about the kingdom of God. Well, I want to go back to that idea of the certainty of the kingdom of God because we tend to give the Pharisees a hard time, right? And rightly so. They're kind of boneheads and they kind of butted heads with Jesus a lot, right? We kind of give them a hard time. But I think it's worth noting that they were looking for the kingdom. Now, maybe it might have been for ulterior motives, but they were looking, they were expecting They lived the certainty of the kingdom. They wanted to make sure they didn't miss it. But their expectations of it prevented them from seeing the reality of the kingdom that was right in front of their faces. I think this relates to us in a couple ways, but one way that I I guess I, I felt convicted is, you know, in this last year, there's been so many different twists and turns. And, um... You know, there's, the cool thing that's come out of this last year and some of the things that have happened is there's just been this renewed interest in the end times, right? What are the signs of the end times, the kingdom, right? And so there's been this renewed interest in that. People are looking for signs of the kingdom. 
But can I suggest that we might be in danger of just what the Pharisees were guilty of, obsessing over signs, you know? Uh, when we look for the future kingdom, it doesn't necessarily mean that I live out the certainty of it today. So if I'm looking for the signs, that doesn't necessarily, I'm meaning, if you follow me here, that if I'm obsessing or looking, I want to know the details, the month, date, the hour of Jesus' second coming, that when I'm looking that way, I may be so tunnel vision that I may not be living out the certainty of his coming today. That's what the Pharisees were kind of doing, right? They were looking. They wanted the signs. They were looking for the coming of the kingdom. They were certain that it was going to come, but they were missing the fact that it was here and now as well. I was reminded of Jesus' words in Matthew 7. That's you know, kind of a challenge and a conviction to me, and I think to all of us. Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. See, when I read that, I, I see the, the conviction there. The, the Lord, Lord, that's a confession of uh, you know, intellectual faith, but it may not be the regenerated life because they're saying, Lord, Lord, did, we did all these things for you, but he's saying not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father, living out the certainty of God's kingdom in the here and now. So what does that mean for you and I? What does that, what does that mean? I guess the question, the conviction that I felt this week as I wrestled with this is, am I living out the certainty of the kingdom of God in my life now? Now, we might long for and look for the day that, you know, heaven is on earth where we reach that place where Jesus comes back, right? We, we can long for that day, but we can live for certainty of it now in our priorities in our choices, in the things that we are doing and saying? Are we using everything that God has given us for the advancement of his kingdom? Let's live out the certainty of God's kingdom because the kingdom of God is certain. Secondly, I think the kingdom of God, uh, what Jesus talks about here is the kingdom of God is personal. It's personal. What am I going to mean by that? Well, let's look at verses 22 through 23. And he said to the disciples, the days are coming when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, look there, or look here. Do not go out or follow them. For as the lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to another, so will the Son of Man be in his day. So many scholars, they, they see this setting kind of changing here, right? Because Jesus was talking to the Pharisees, and now he's talking to his disciples. And so some time has passed, or they've gone into a place, as Jesus would often do with, with his disciples. He would teach, he would give a parable or talk, and then he'd take his disciples aside, and then he would kind of explain it or expound on it. That's kind of what many scholars think is happening here. And, and he's talking about here, he says that there's going to be a desire for the, the days of the Son of Man, right? The desire for the kingdom, right? There's that desire for the kingdom to come on, on earth. But he says, but, you know, you're not going to see it. You know, it's in your midst, but it's not yet, right? There's this tension that we walk in. And he warns his, his followers. He's warning them. He's saying, be careful. You know, there are going to be people who are going to come around. They're going to say, look there or look here. And he, then he, he gives them the warning. He says, don't go follow them. Right? The, the idea that obscurity breeds conspiracy, right? And that's kind of what I'm seeing here is that people are going to say, here it is or there it is. But he's saying, don't follow them. Be discerning. Be wise. Be careful. In other places where Jesus talks about the second coming or the, the end times, he, he's, he, his underlying teaching is be ready, be prepared, be ready. And so I, I almost hear him saying this here to the disciples now. He's saying, be ready. Be careful, be discerning, be wise. 
In essence, what he's saying is that people are going to be pursuing the wrong things. They're going to be looking for and pursuing the wrong things. But I notice here, and I, and I hope you notice here as well, it's interesting. The first two verses, 20 and 21, the kingdom of God is kind of talking in impersonal terms. And now all of a sudden, it's related to the kingdom of a person, the son of man. It becomes more personal in its relation. It becomes more personal in its application. And I think that it's intentional. The idea of instead of pursuing the concept of utopia or heaven on earth, instead of pursuing that idea or concept of the kingdom, pursue the person, the king, who brings in the kingdom. And so to make that simple to apply for us today, we need to be pursuing the king over and seeking, you know, over and above seeking answers to or details concerning the coming of the kingdom. You know, the Pharisees, they wanted examples. They wanted signs. They wanted to make sure that they weren't going to miss. But they missed the person who was ushering in the kingdom, who was standing in their midst, who'd been ministering for years, who gave them the signs that they needed to know that the kingdom was coming. So instead of truly seeing Jesus and the signs of the kingdom, they wanted to know the nitty-gritty details. And I think that we can run into that danger as well with that renewed interest in the end times and the desire for the kingdom of God to be, you know, Jesus' second coming. People are being led to seek knowledge about the signs of the end. You know, what this person might announce, the kingdom is coming on this such and such a date. And so there's a bunch of people, they flock to that person, right? Or, or the, the person may say, you know, I have this divine revelation. God wants me to do this or to save this or to uphold this nation or whatever that might be. And people flock to that person. Or people may say, you know, I've seen the celestial signs. I've kind of went through the Bible and all these blood moons and all these predictions and prophecies. They light up and people flock over to there, right? They pursue the signs. They pursue the, I want to know the nitty gritty details. But maybe they're not pursuing the person, Jesus. Matthew 24, 26, Jesus says, But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. See, Jesus, he's warned his disciples, and he continuously warned his disciples to be discerning, to be wise, to be ready, to seek him over and above anything and everything else. Think about Jesus' teaching in Matthew chapter 6 when he's talking about anxiety and, 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 and worry, right? And he says, don't worry, don't be anxious about these things. But then he, he says in verse 33 of chapter 6, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things will be added to you. Seek first. Seek first and foremost Jesus. Focus on him. And all those other questions, all that other minutia, that'll, that'll fade in comparison to pursuing and knowing Jesus and trusting in his timing. And so the kingdom of God, it's personal. And then finally, the kingdom of God is unmistakable. The kingdom of God is unmistakable. Let's look at verses 24 through 37 of chapter 17 of Luke. For as lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to another, so will the Son of Man be in his day. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But on that day... When Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. So will it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, let the one who is in the housetop with his goods and in, in the house not come down to take them away. And likewise, let the one who is in the field not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life will keep it. I tell you, in that night there will be two in bed. One will be taken, the other left. There will be two women grinding together. One will be taken, the other left. And they said to him, Where, Lord? And he said to them, Where the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Kind of a, kind of a bleak saying there. But, you know, really at the heart of the question that the Pharisees were saying here is they, they wanted to know the, the, the desire to know the signs. They wanted to know. They wanted to not miss the kingdom of God and its, and its coming. And, and I think Jesus' response is interesting because he gives those few analogies, right? The first analogy he talks about is lightning flashes across the sky, right? We had some storms roll through not too long ago. 
Many of you probably saw the impressive lightning, you know, displays. You know, I remember going outside at one point and I just saw it just arc across the sky. It was really cool looking. You've probably seen something like that. And just as that, that lightning is unmistakable, right, it's powerful, it's unmistakable, Jesus is saying that, you know, the coming of the kingdom, it's going to be unmistakable. He also talks about Noah and Lot, right, and those things, it was unmistakable what was going to happen there, but also those stories that really were accounts of judgment, which is also how the kingdom will come, right? When we read in Revelation 19 and 20, right, it, the kingdom is going to come and it's going to be unmistakable, and there's judgment, right? And so the reality is, is that's kind of how Jesus is, is illustrating here. He's helping them to understand. And then in verses 34 through 35, you know, kind of talking about that it's going to be, you know, unexpected, right? Uh, the kingdom's coming. is It's going to be unexpected or sudden. But basically the kingdom, what Jesus is saying here, it's going to be unmistakable. You're going to know when the kingdom of God is here. And we see that unmistakable aspect of the kingdom of God when we read in Revelation, right? In Revelation 19 and 20, when Jesus returns and he sets up his millennial reign, that's the thousand-year reign of, of Christ, right? That's literally going to be the closest thing to heaven on earth that earth can ever see. And the reality is, is that when that happens, that's going to be when the kingdom comes. It's going to be sudden. It's going to be unexpected. And there's going to be judgment, right? That's kind of how Jesus is saying the kingdom is going to come. But the kingdom of God is God's reign through God's people, which I tend to think and believe that it means that we can experience the kingdom here on earth through the church. I'm talking about the universal church, which is the outpost of God's kingdom here on earth, right? The kingdom, it's here, but it's not yet. So when we gather together to sing praises to Jesus, when we exalt his name and preach his name, and proclaim his name when we minister to one another using our gifts and abilities and talents when we minister to one another in his name it's a snapshot really of the kingdom of god the outpost of god's kingdom that's advancing in enemy territory and so that's partly how we can experience the kingdom now that's here but it's not yet we live in this tension but it happens in the church, in the people of God. God's reign through God's people over God's place. That's the kingdom of God. Remember what Jesus told his followers in John 13, 35. He says that people would know that you're my di disciples if you have what? Love for one another. Jesus also talked about in John 15, verse 8. He said that it's to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So when someone steps into church, right, when any church, if it's proclaiming Jesus, singing and exalting him, and ministering out of overflow to one another, right, when someone steps into the church, it should be unmistakable, right, that the kingdom of God is present and advancing. It should be unmistakable in the fruit that we bear, right, that brings glory to God, and it should be unmistakable in how we love one another, See, the kingdom of God will come in its fullness when Jesus returns. But until then, we live in that tension of the here, but not yet of the kingdom. But the church, it should be unmistakable as an outpost of the kingdom of God advancing in a dark world. And sadly, too many times, this isn't the case. May that not be the case with our church. We want to be living out the love of God. We want to be living out our, our gifts and abilities. We want to be exalting Christ. We want to be an outpost where people see un, or changed lives and that it's unmistakable. So the kingdom of God, it's unmistakable. So the big idea I want us to walk away with today as we wrap up, pursue the king over a kingdom. Pursue the king over a kingdom. Know the king and live for his kingdom now. So pursue the king over a kingdom. Know the king and live for his kingdom now. So Zootopia had envisioned this kind of world where there was peace and harmony and it was heaven on earth, right? And the pursuit of utopia is within the heart of the human condition, I think, because it's arguably wired into us, part of the fingerprints of God, that he created us for so much more. The reality is that on our own power, our own strength, there's no way that we can bring about utopia, the kingdom of God here on earth, because it's fallen, it's marred by sin, and that's why Jesus came. 
See, the only utopia, the only heaven on earth that we can experience is through Jesus' reign. The song that we just sang. Now and forever, God, you reign. The reality is, as Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is saying to enter into this kingdom, it's not going to be by trying to get yourself there or building it here on earth. It's only through me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. So I want to just issue us a challenge and close us in prayer. Maybe you're saying, you know what, Tyler, I, I, I've been kind of trying to do all this stuff on my own. I never knew that I'm supposed to kind of pledge my entire allegiance to Jesus. I've never done that, but I want to do that today. Thankfully, it's as easy as ABC. A, we admit our sin. The Bible tells us we all sin, and we all fall short of the glory of God. And so, A, we have to admit sin. B, believe that Jesus died for our sin. It's not by being a good enough person or trying to do enough good things to build our way back to God. It's only by grace through faith. It's only by the shed blood of Christ on the cross that our sins can be wiped away and forgiven. And that we're transferred over from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. We're told that. And so B, believe that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And then C, call on Jesus for salvation. Commit to following him. And that's, that's meaning when I commit and call on Jesus for salvation, I'm saying, you're in charge. You're the king. If you've never done that, I want to give you the opportunity to do that today. So with all eyes closed and heads bowed, maybe you're saying, you know what, Tyler, I've, I've never done that, but I want to do that today. I want to encourage you to pray a prayer like this to the Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin. Lord Jesus, Come into my life and, and save me. Help me. Help me to live for you. Help me to live for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, we're going to take communion. If you uh, have your communion cup, please get that out. If you didn't get one, uh, we can have some available to you. We'll bring those out. If you need a communion cup, just uh, put your hand up and we'll be sure to get one to you. And so, really, just some requirements for communion. We don't really have many um, <laughs> that are extra or anything like that. First, we don't require you that you need to be a member of a church. Um, you know, if you're a member of God's family, we invite you to partake together with us. And then secondly, you know, the Bible tells us and encourages us not to take communion in an unworthy manner. That means if we have sin in our lives, we need to be confessing that to the Lord. And if we've not done that, we need to be intentional about doing that. Uh, and to take communion in a way that brings honor to the Lord. And so uh, those are really the only requirements that we have for communion. But what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to take you know, the bread first, and then we're going to take the cups. And so just kind of flip it over there. You just got to kind of peel it back there. And uh, I'm going to read for us from 1 Corinthians 11. It says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus and the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for your body that was broken for us, for our sin, for our mistakes, for our brokenness. You didn't have to do it. You chose to do it because of your love for us. And so, Lord, we thank you, Jesus, for your body that was broken for us. And, Lord, help us to not take that for granted. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's partake together. He goes on to say in the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Lord, thank you for your blood that was shed for us. Hebrews tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness, there is no remission of sin, and yet this blood is precious. Forgive us of the times that we screw up, we mess up. We take the shed blood of Christ for granted. 
thank you that your blood was sufficient to satisfy God's wrath against our sin, to bring us and cover us and bring us into right standing with him. We don't deserve it. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's partake together. Well, at this time, if you'd please stand with me, we'll conclude our service today with our final worship song.
Thank you so much for joining us today. Go in the, the, the peace, the knowledge that you have been freed from sin in Christ and that you are freed to live for him and his kingdom here and now. Have a wonderful week. God bless. We'll see you next week.